Do you need to find the skills to How would you tell people that this is? You first, first, first. How would you tell this? Well, I don't know. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Last time we saw that two famous experiments have already tested Randy Galoose's idea of continuous environmental tracking, and shown that it simply doesn't exist in any meaningful way. But hey, let's see what else he has for us. Take it away, Randy. Now would you expect anything less from the Lord Jesus? I have no idea what I would expect from him. I also don't plan on coming up with an answer to that. Who is going to build something into his creatures to continuously attract environments to not just always be reacting, but to be proactive in advance so that they can adjust as necessary. Not in terms of multi-generational timescales and demonstrated quite well by multiple experiments. So I want to go through very quickly because we have three parts to this talk. I want to show you some examples of how they do it. I want to discuss how it works. I want to give you some predictions of what I expect to find when we finally reverse engineer the biology and figure out how what's happening on all of this. This is this is totally new. Nobody's doing this. It is really old, and the reason that no one is doing it is sort of the same reason no one is really investigating how to build an ornithopter. We tried. We tried really hard for years. It just doesn't seem to be working. Nobody's doing this in the creationists. Nobody's even doing this amongst the secularists. But I want to give you some examples. So obviously, we want to start with all kinds of creatures, plants, and this is one for tomato plants. And they were exposing tomato plants to um, a creature, I think it was a slug in this case, that would eat the tomato plants. And this is what they found in these papers. New research now shows that some flora can detect an herbivorous animal. What's herbivorous? One that eats a plant. Well before it launches an assault, letting a plant mount a preemptive defense that even works against other pests. Wow! Of course, this study is linked in the description, and of course, while it's cool, it doesn't actually do anything to indicate that tomatoes have a way to adapt their genetics to future environments. Instead, it's an example of tomato plants picking up on incidental chemical signals from herbivores in their environment to make themselves less palatable as food at the cost of slower growth. Which, sure, is an example of a cool mechanism for phenotypic plasticity, but we need far more than this for continuous environmental tracking to be a real thing. The plant isn't even attacked. But it says, I think I'm going to get attacked. And so it starts to make its defenses. Hey, remember back when Randy said that he wanted to get rid of all anthropomorphism in science? And how it was never okay? Well, guess what? Saying that the damn tomato plant says anything is anthropomorphizing the tomato. So I guess it's okay to anthropomorphize as long as you're clear that you don't actually think tomatoes, or presumably nature itself, are actual persons. And in this experiment, as they start out, none of the plants were actually ever attacked. Oh, so he just didn't read the text of the paper. They were attacked by caterpillars, granted in a highly unusual way, but it still occurred. Just go read the paper yourself. The lead investigator said, we just gave them cues that suggested an attack was coming. What was the cue? Slug slime. Slug slime. They could detect the slug slime. That's better than looking at the mouse, at the monkey butts that Dr. Thomas was talking about here. Slug slime. We gave them cues that suggested an attack was coming, and that was enough to trigger big changes in their chemistry. Wow, not just big changes in their chemistry, but optimized changes in their chemistry. Yep, plants are real cool. Now I wonder, how will snail mucus let a tomato know what will be happening in a year or so so it can induce mutations? It says that when they exposed them to this, they were able to generate a defensive response in plants that have not been attacked. And plants integrate the many sources of information regarding attack in their environment to optimize investment in their defenses. Okay, I'm skipping any more examples of an organism being able to sense present conditions which allows it to respond to the immediate future in a way that does not actually do anything to explain genetic differences as a result of adaptation to the changing environments. Since I haven't seen all of this yet, uh, that might mean I'm done here. Do animals have emotions? Well, humans are animals and they have emotions, but also I think it's silly to say that other animals don't have emotions, especially those similar to humans and who display what look like emotions. Oh, you better believe they do. 
They're very conscious. Very, very conscious in that. And she loves her little cub right there. Hey, I agree. How does it happen? Well, here's a cool paper that was on error management dealing with these trans transgenerational effects. And they said this. Oh, hey, look, more phenotypic plasticity. So no change in genetics. Oh, well, it's in the description. And now we skip again. You are an individual. You're even an individual compared to your parents. Your parents are your parents. You are you. You are a distinct, autonomous individual, even though you've got your arm on your lovely wife. You're two separate beings. Mom, when that baby is developing in you, it is a separate human being. Is this about to become about a portion? I really hope not. But yes, in utero, a fetus is still a member of its species, and its mother is not the same member of the species. This isn't exactly controversial. It's a separate human being. Mom, you cannot change the baby as it's developing. Really? Let me introduce you to fetal alcohol syndrome, which is caused by excessive alcohol exposure in the womb. It can cause small eyes, a thin upper lip, upturned nose, deformities of the limbs, slow growth and short stature, vision and hearing problems, small head and brain size, and heart, kidney, and bone disease. That's a change people make to their babies. Ever know someone taking, or have you taken yourself, prenatal vitamins? Those are there to change your baby from being malnourished to being well-nourished. There's another change people make to their babies. Both occur during pregnancy. You absolutely can change your baby, intentionally or unintentionally, at least phenotypically. What you can't do is change it genetically, at least not yet. But the thing is, changing it genetically is precisely what Randy needs. You cannot get in there and directly change it. Baby starts from a single cell organism, single cell, and baby self-constructs. Baby self-constructs. What mom can do, mom can act as a sensor of the environment. Mom can send information in, but mom cannot directly change baby's DNA. Which is a problem for Galuz's ideas. He needs mom to be able to do this for his ideas to work. Let's see if he notices that himself. Okay, so the evidence that babies can change their own genome is that there was a paper that said that they didn't. No, Randy, that doesn't make a lick of sense. Phenotypic plasticity explicitly refers to the ability of organisms to use the same genotype to produce varying phenotypes. You can't jump from that to therefore organisms can change their genotype intentionally to get the phenotype they need. Mom can send information in, and then baby, as a separate organism, can detect mom's information, bring it into itself, and adjust itself. Does that make sense? Okay, so at least now we have a model for how continuous environmental tracking is supposed to work, at least in placental mammals. Not sure how we're supposed to apply that to everyone else, but now it's time for Randy to produce a shred of evidence that placental mammal embryos mutate their own genome in response to stimuli from their mothers about the environment she's encountering. And remember, It'll have to be something other than phenotypic plasticity because that's exactly what doesn't matter at this point. In other words, there's no magic where mom reaches in and changes it. There has to be an engineered system. Mom sends data, baby must have a what? A sensor for mom's data. A sensor for mom's data and then baby adjusts itself. That is how you get two separate entities to work together. I know because that's how engineers build them. So. This is what we're going to discuss in these changes. It goes on to say this. However, maternal stress can play adaptive roles across a wide varieties of animal taxa if stress-induced phenotypes better prepare offspring for a stressful postnatal environment. In what kinds of animals? Mammals, birds, reptiles, and fish. All right, so let's say it can happen across the much shorter time in which maternal chemistry can affect the embryo. I guess the model is now proposed to encompass all vertebrates, more or less, despite the fact that the paper in question says that such induced mutations did not happen. Does that seem like it's pretty comprehensive? Yeah, yeah it's pretty comprehensive that, that parents can do this. Well, here's an, uh, here's an interesting one. We'll start out with <clears throat> a pretty basic creature, very highly complicated, a sea urchin. Great. Another article to link in the description. Let's see if it actually involves genetic changes to the sea urchins. And these researchers are worried about global warming. 
In fact, a, a, a lot of really good research comes out of the fact that people, many scientists, are scared to death of global warming. So they want to know what's going to happen to creatures if the environment changes. And in this particular case, they're wondering if the ocean pH changes, if the ocean temperature changes, if those changes in the ocean become stressful, what are creatures like sea urchins going to do? And it says that they're going to change their gene expression, but not their genome in the short run. You know, exactly the opposite of what Dr. Galuza needs. Again, check the description. You know, traditionally, the way you use a paper as a source is you find a paper that actually supports your position, not one that either contradicts it or fails to support it. Here's another one on little nematode, a tiny little word called worm called C. elegans. And in this particular case, they starved mom. Well, at least we're out of deuterostomia, but again, it's just phenotypic plasticity, not induced mutations. So let's try again. P.S. Study in the description. Here's another one. Oh, hey. A study that didn't even look at the genetics of the animals in question. Guess this one is a bust too, but it's still in the description if you want to read it. Next. How about humans? I'm very confident that humans have phenotypic plasticity, some of which is determined in utero. So, like the other six examples we've seen, I'm sure nothing here is about to help Galuza in any way. Any, any effect on humans, cross-generational effect? Well, yes. There's a, multiple studies on this. On cross, How many like that picture? Isn't that a great picture? That's, a, that's another one. Moms love their kids too, in that case. Was maternal affection in humans in some serious doubt? This one was a study done in Norway. Oh hey look, our seventh paper finding absolutely no evidence for induced mutation as a result of prenatal conditioning. Yay! It's in the description, as you know. There was another one that was done on men in the Philippines and they were also checking on birth weight and size and testosterone production as they got older and aggressiveness. And they also checked whether they attracted more females or less females. It was a really a great study on all of this, on that. And, and uh, they found that... And uh, I guess it's not going to be cited. So the source for this is, trust me, bro, from Dr. Galuza. Well, given his track record, I don't trust him. Unfortunately, in China, about 1959 to 1964, they had one of their five-year plans in China where they were going to change the effects of agriculture. Unfortunately, like many of their five-year plans, it didn't boost agricultural production, it had it plummet. Yep, historically, centrally planned agriculture is about as bad as just not having agriculture. It's a recipe for disaster. And between 1959 and 1964, about 40 million Chinese people starved to death. 40 million. Yes, there's a reason I'm not a fan of the Chinese Communist Party, and this is part of it. This explains when I was a kid, and I was growing up in the 60s, my mom always said to me, eat everything on your plate, there's starving children in China. My mom used to say something similar, and she was not amused when one day I asked if I could send the starving children the food I didn't want. And I'm like, this meant nothing to me. Now I'm 60 years old, it's like, oh, now I know what my mom was saying. There's starving children in China. Eat everything on your plate. And there. It's still a silly thing to say, even knowing that he knows that she wasn't lying about the starving children. What happened? Well, this, was, this provided a natural laboratory because they were able to follow the children of parents who obviously didn't starve to death, but were in severe starvation conditions in cities versus the children of parents who migrated to the city who were not starved. Awesome, so let's see a paper that shows the consistent deterministic mutations induced by this common prenatal environment. And they were able to follow the effects of children whose parents, mom was starved, or dad was starved, or mom and dad were starved, what the effects on, of that were to them versus children whose parents were, weren't starved in the same city as time went on. And guess what they found? Well, given that we're currently 0 for 7 on showing actually induced mutations, and rather all we've seen is phenotypic plasticity, I'm going to say that we're in for an eighth instance of phenotypic plasticity where there is not a whiff of induced deterministic mutation as required for Galuza's ideas to work. Let's see, shall we? This was, oh, uh, we'll, we'll skip on this uh, right there. They found 
that prenatal exposure to famine, prenatal exposures to famine, that means that your parents were being starved while you were in your mother's womb, prenatal exposure, the odds of developing hyperglycemia were about two to one in both children and grandchildren, and the probability of developing type two diabetes in the children of starved parents was 75% higher compared to those offspring whose parents were not starved. Ah, yet again, this is all epigenetics and phenotypic plasticity when you check the paper. And in this case, it was actually maladaptive, not adaptive. So we're giving Randy two L's, not one. Looks like he's over nine. I'm sure the next one will be the one. Why do you think that could be? So let's start connecting our dots. If the children are born to starved parents, they probably have what? The thrifty phenotype, which means they become calorie hoarders. Yeah, diabetes isn't gonna help you with hoarding calories. You'll just die if untreated. Sorry, Randy, but we're moving on. They tend to hoard their calories. And so, that because they're anticipating being born in a starvation environment, but they did not grow up in a starvation environment. They did not grow up in a calorie deficient environment. They grew up in an abundant calorie abundant environment. Therefore, their phenotype to store and hoard calories led to them developing hyperglycemia and diabetes faster. You know, that's not the worst argument here. But also, Randy said that organisms can look ahead years into the future. So why do their parents not realize that starvation conditions wouldn't persist? I guess maybe organisms can't stunt the future beyond their immediate environment. But I'll be nice and say that because I actually like the point about maladaptation being because they were adapted for a different environment, we'll set the loss counter back to 0 for 8. Now Randy can't ever say I didn't do anything for him. Well, how in the world does all of this happen? How are we going to explain these things? What are the mechanisms for it? The mechanisms for what? Epigenetics? Well, basically, certain environmental conditions can cause things like changes to the physical structure, but not the sequence of the genome, making it so that certain less needed or unneeded genes are less likely to be expressed, changing the biochemistry and therefore the phenotype of the organism. For example, if a particular enzyme is not needed, that area of DNA may become methylated, which will cause it to curl up on itself, making it much harder to transcribe such that the particular enzyme is no longer expressed in the organism, even though the genotype still contains the ability to do so. Epigenetics is a pretty big field, but it's not like we don't know anything about how it works. We also know that it can't explain the changes in the genotypes that we see in the wild and in the lab when organisms adapt to evolve to new environments over many generations. Well, evolutionists have their mechanisms to try to explain things that are happening all around them. In fact, their perceptions really had to change because initially they thought that the small brains of insects and other invertebrates are often thought to constrain these animals entirely in the moment. Okay, so now are we changing the mechanism from prenatal chemical signaling inducing mutations in offspring to conscious thought inducing mutations in adult or juveniles long after maternal signaling has ceased? Because that's a very different model. Arthropods being smarter than we thought doesn't really tell us anything about their capacity to induce mutations in response to environmental stimuli which again, we know bacteria definitely do not do. So I'm not sure why we're just assuming that crabs or butterflies can, but even more so, this doesn't help with organisms like the aforementioned tomato, which has no ability to think whatsoever. In other words, their tiny brain only lets them live what? Right for the instant, but that's not true. Actually found that even with insects, that they have foresight. We propose a basic form of foresight the ability to predict the outcome of one's own actions is at the heart of such behavioral flexibility. Is Randy just picking out the word foresight and then assuming the paper in question supports him just because it has a thematic similarity in one aspect of his ill-defined continuous environmental tracking? Sure seems that way. Well, their substitute God, the natural selector, selector he's going to act like God but he's not going to do it as a real engineer would do because that would sound a lot too much like design. So your good bud here that all of you recognize, Richard Dawkins, says... He's not a bud of mine. In fact, I have a lot of criticisms. That natural selection, notice what he says about natural selection. The blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered, he didn't discover, he invented. 
Gonna need to see a citation for that one, Randy, because so far it does look like he discovered it, and nothing has been shown so far that would contradict that. And which we now know is the explanation for the existence of apparently purposeful forms of all life. Oh, what did natural selection do? Caused those organisms with genotypes that enabled better reproductive success in a particular environment to cause those genotypes and the associated phenotypes to predominate in the populations, allowing organisms to radiate into new niches and become better and better at their current niches as time wore on. It brought about the apparently purposeful forms of all life. It created everything, but it has no purpose in mind. It has no mind and no mind's eye. It does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. So I remember that time that Randy was telling us how scientists were attributing personal characteristics to nature inappropriately. I guess he was lying because now we can see he knows that that's not what's happening. It's always nice when creationists just come out and catch themselves in a lie. Francis Crick, co-discoverer DNA, said, I suspect that some people also dislike the idea that natural selection has no foresight. The process itself, in effect, does not know where to go. It is the environment that provides the direction. And the over the long run, its effects are largely unpredictable in detail. Yeah, I can understand people not liking that. But hey, science isn't here to make you like it. It's here to give us the best description of the physical world it is possible to give with the available evidence. And the world's leading researchers on lizards, Jonathan Loso says, you must remember that natural selection has no foresight. It will not favor a mutation because it will be useful in the future. So what they're trying to say is... Exactly like we saw in the Luria Delbruck experiment. Mutations happen independent of environment and can then be selected for or against as they arise. And remember, the counter to this was eight papers none of which included any indication of induced deterministic mutations as a result of environmental pressures. This substitute God doesn't act like a real engineer. It uses random broken things like mutation, and it doesn't even have a plan. It has no foresight. It's also not a substitute God. Just ask the majority of religious people of all religions who don't think that the reality of evolution has replaced their religious belief. It just ambles along and cobbles creatures together. In other words, they want to push back against any idea that anybody would have that when you look at creatures, they were really engineered and designed. I wouldn't care to push back against it if, you know, there were some evidence. Instead, it's usually just lies. You know, like misrepresenting eight papers in a row about phenotypic plasticity as having some relevance to induced mutations, or a paper about arthropod intelligence as being about the ability of arthropods to induce heritable mutations in themselves in response to things about how to traverse a complicated 3D environment or predict the flight path of prey, when in fact the paper doesn't talk about any such thing. Because they want to use all the anti-design language that they could possibly muster. Random, no foresight, no plan, no purpose, nothing. It's not that these scientists are against design, it's that there's no need to include that hypothesis. It's not parsimonious, and non-design ideas already fit the data perfectly well. All of that is so they can condition those college students, which Dr. Thomas was talking to the other night, so they say, no plan, no purpose, no engineering, no design. This is what you need to see. Darwin was not there to explain the diversity of life on Earth. Funny then how we spent literally the entirety of his most famous book trying to do just that. Darwin was there to explain the design of life on Earth, which was the eminent testimony to God. Well, he definitely didn't try to do that, so I don't know, man. Maybe Randy should actually read Origin of Species. And he wanted a substitute agent to do it. Nope. In fact, it wasn't even his observations that finally led to his loss of faith. It was the death of his daughter. And he was reluctant about his findings, especially because he thought it would be troublesome for his wife's faith. Because by all indications, Charles Darwin was a loving family man who cared deeply about his wife and children. But even if he had, that's just a genetic fallacy. Evolution is wrong because the person most famous for discovering it was a meanie. That's not a real argument. And that's why all of this language about no purpose, no plan, no foresight, random, mutation, broken, blah, 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 chokes evolutionary literature. I gotta say, the guy who complained about science anthropomorphizing nature is now anthropomorphizing language about how we shouldn't anthropomorphize nature written by scientists. That's like double irony. That's why. It's to push back against any notion of a creator. 
Tell it to Theodosius Dobzhansky, who said, Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and who was also an Eastern Orthodox Christian who believed in a creator. Anyway, what these guys would have you believe is this, this totally blind process, which is somehow driven by death. Differential reproductive success, not death. Where one animal builds itself on the backs of the death and the extinction of so many others, this death-driven worldview with no purpose, no desire, no consciousness, no foresight, somehow crafted creatures by the jillions that show overwhelming purpose, overwhelming desires. They have consciousness, they have foresight, and they have anticipation. Fun fact, personal incredulity isn't an argument. Does that make any sense? Yes. No sense. Look, if he's not going to make an argument, why should I? In fact, it's incoherent. Uh... No. <laughs> I'm going to need a source on that one there. So, we need to do biology as if Darwin had never been born. I'm down with that, but the thing is, we already do. Darwin isn't a prophet. His ideas aren't sacred or believed because he proposed them. In fact, a number of his ideas have been completely rejected because they are contrary to the evidence that has since been gathered. That's not my statement. That's Paul Nelson's, but I love it. So if we're going to do biology as if Darwin had never been born, what we need to do is replace back into biology what Darwin took out. Only if you can find evidence for it. So far, none has even been hinted at. The thing is that while we remember great scientists for amazing new discoveries, that's only after the evidence has shown them to be right. We don't teach relativity in school because Einstein was so cool. It's taught because it corresponds to reality and can make successful predictions about future data. This is also true about evolution. If both Einstein and Darwin were erased from all human memory, there would be no reason for either biology or physics to change. In other words, Darwin went from looking at, uh, before Darwin, looking at what creatures could do, looking at their internal, innate capabilities, to what he said is, let's look at the environment of how the environment is shaping and molding creatures. Those aren't mutually exclusive things. We need to go back as if Darwin is not there and start looking back again into the internal capabilities of organisms. And this dude cited nine papers literally doing that. People are already on it. It just doesn't support his claims. You can't just assume that you're right and then go about explaining biology that way. You have to show that your ideas are robust and well-supported before you can use them as the basis for further research. The thing is that evolution and natural selection as a part of it have done that to the satisfaction of the scientific community. That's why they're science. And then begin to explain it as it really is as an engineered system. Actually, it's an engineered system made up of many, many, many systems. This is what we can do. And when we bring this engineered adaptability approach back into biology, we will rid biology of all of the magical language. Yeah, we're going to get rid of the magical language of, you know, ordinary physical processes and replace it with a totally not magical language of actual magic. Makes perfect sense. Which chokes evolutionary literature. Again with the personification, huh? We will bring some clarity of thought will bring some cohesiveness and explanation, which is totally lacking. So how would we do that? Well, this car right here is adaptable. It has sensors, speed sensors. It has a computer. And it doesn't reproduce with either induced predetermined mutations or random ones. So who cares? Moving on. We need to go back right from the very beginning and change our thinking about why adaptation happens. The dominant creationist teaching, which, is, which has been about for many years, is that adaptation is a response to the fall. After the fall, creatures needed to adapt. Wrong. 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 Interesting. So, I guess things before the fall weren't perfect, and organisms could suffer ill effects, presumably up to and including death, from changing environments in the prelapsarian world. Right from the very beginning, the Bible says there were conditions that were dynamic. The Bible says right from the beginning that there were day and night cycles. Does that make the earth a dynamic place? Over the course of an individual organism's life, yes. 
over the course of a population's multi-generational time on Earth? No. Intergenerational adaptation doesn't happen on a time scale of days or even years in most cases. We're talking like decades at the minimum for most organisms. If the day-night cycle and seasons are the same over that kind of time frame, then they count as constant as far as multi-generational adapting populations are concerned. The Bible says that there were going to be seasons and we we're going to mark those seasons by the stars. Do seasons make the earth a dynamic place? Again, not on any relevant time scale. The Bible said be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. When one creature goes in and fills a niche where other creatures are, does that make it dynamic for those creatures? In this case, yes. But also that dynamism is going to lead to differential reproductive success if there is genetic variability in the organisms, which means we're going to have natural selection. So if I came in and I filled your niche, I would change your niche. For the better, of course. That's literally impossible. If two organisms are occupying the same niche in the real world, and either they will partition the niche or one of them will be driven to extinction, at least locally. But I would change your niche. I would change your niche on all of that. But the Bible also says, so the Bible says that the, the earth was dynamic, but the Bible also says creatures reproduce after their kind. Hey, it's our best friend, the never defined kind, which comes from the Hebrew word mean, mim yod nun, which means kind, sex, gender, or genus. You know, the same things covered by the English word used to translate it. It's a vague grouping of things that are similar enough to be considered a group for a current discussion. So what mean of animal is that? Oh, it's a mammal. Okay, what mean of mammal? Well, it's a horse. What mean of horse? It's a Clydesdale foal. See how it's stupid to take the word as some kind of technical term? And further, of course animals reproduce after their mean. That's kind of the whole point of selection. If organisms didn't pass on their genetics in a way that resulted in similar offspring, then selection couldn't work because the advantageous genotype in a parent would have no correlation to the phenotype of the offspring. But all right, we're going to wrap that up. Next time, we will be back to talk about things like robustness, and we're going to have a little bit of talk from Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal, who has agreed to help me out with this series. So I first want to say a very special thank you to him for the upcoming help with the next episode. Anyway, if you like this video, please make sure you hit like. If you didn't like it, well, put it in the comments why you didn't like it. Either way, I do hope that you subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed, and do turn on all notifications so you're always notified when there's more Dapper Dino content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Landon Knoll, Yepetus, Mabdi Babdi, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. The people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if the annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.